Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. The word of God for our consideration for today is our gospel, John chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this past week, the Academy Awards announced which movies were up for Oscars this year. And the movie The Revenant, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, was up for a whopping 12 Oscars. It's amazing what the movie industry does in order to garner our interest in what movies are coming. I want you to think about it for a moment. The biggest movie in blockbuster history, Star Wars The Force Awakens. Do you remember the first time you saw a trailer for that movie? The movie came out in December, but they first released a trailer all the way back in April. Eight months of teasing you, saying this movie is coming and they would release a trailer every now and then showing new images new pictures, giving you little tiny glimpses so that your interest would be sparked, so that you would anticipate it, and so that they would get the results that they did. That force of fans that descended on the theaters, making this the most successful movie ever. Well today, as we continue in the season of Epiphany, we've sort of seen God using trailers or teasers to garner our attention. We just got done singing that hymn and you probably noticed that word manifest over and over and over again. God displaying his splendor, displaying his glory in his son. And think back to when Epiphany started. Those star-navigated magi came to that house. They worshipped the infant son, the infant savior. Then last week we heard how Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. The Holy Spirit descended. The, God, the Father declared. And now he's making really a public debut. His premiere to show who he really is. And so this morning as we study God's word together, as we see this first miracle that Jesus does, we see Jesus, what Jesus really can do. Now as you think about this. You might not expect Jesus to act the way he did or to go to this place to really start his ministry on the scene. You know, if, if we thought he wanted to seek popularity, we'd expect him to go to Jerusalem, go to the amphitheater there, have a concert or something. Or maybe go to Caesarea Marentima, the, the seat of the Roman prefect. Go to the Hippodrome there that seated 100,000 people and there announced to the world who he was. But now as we listen to our lesson today, he doesn't choose either one of those. He goes to this unglorious village of Cana, just a couple miles away from his hometown of Nazareth. And it wasn't some big concert, it wasn't some big revival, it was couple being married. The couple were not even told their names in this village wedding. Jesus was invited. His first six disciples that he had gathered around him were there with him. And Jesus' mother was there. And then throughout the course of the week-long marriage festivities, a potentially embarrassing situation arises. Mary, his mother, comes up to Jesus with concern and says, they have no more wine. Think about Mary. Remember back in Luke chapter 2, after the shepherds came to visit, we hear that Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then we saw as Jesus, the 12-year-old boy, was at the temple teaching the teachers. Mary treasured up all these things. Mary treasured up the prophecies. She had seen the Magi come to worship him. She had seen all this and thought perhaps he could do it. He could do something about it. His, her son, God's son, could do something. 
She had her heart in the right place, right? She went to the right person. And yet as Jesus addresses her, he doesn't jump in both feet and come to the rescue, but has a mild rebuke for her. He says to his mother, Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Sounds a little harsh, doesn't it? Sounds almost a little disrespectful. Woman, why are you getting me involved? Oh, we perhaps lose a little something in the English translation. But what Jesus was telling his mother was, you don't have a part in my salvation activity. Things had changed a little bit. He had begun his ministry. He was no longer her little boy running errands for her. Now this is God's son. He's about his father's work. But yet Mary had hope in his response because he hadn't told her no. He had simply said not yet. He was going to act, but he was going to act in his father's time, not in his mother's time. He was going to act and fulfill the purpose that God had in mind for, for that situation. He was going to reveal his glory. But not yet. Think about when you go to the restaurant Subway. You get this long list of sandwiches, hot or cold, that you can get. But it amazes me the number of options you have. No two sandwiches have to be alike, do they? You're not stuck with, this is the stock sandwich, and if I don't like something on it, I have to pick it off. Or I'm not left wanting and saying, I really wish this would have this kind of ingredient on it. No, you order your sandwich and you say, I want this and that and not that. Dictating to your sandwich artist what you want on your sandwich. Or think about going to a nicer restaurant. The waiter comes around, takes your order. You can tell how you want your steak done. You can pick your side. Whether you want your salad dressing on your salad, the type of salad, what kind of dessert you're going to have, you can, in a sense, dictate what that waiter will bring you. And if it's not what you want, if something's not quite right, you can take the risk of sending it back, hoping you get a good plate of food back when he returns. But do we sometimes approach God that same way in our prayer life? We have no problem telling God what we want, our situation. But then do we sometimes turn it and start dictating to him how he should answer it? We kind of treat him like our waiter, don't we? This waiter who has come along, this waiter who has come to be with us, to serve us. The temptation is there to say, God, here's what I want you to do for me. Here's how I want you to fix it. And we leave no room for him to act because we've set such parameters for him that he can't act. Sometimes we have obstacles to our prayer life. Martin Luther put it this way. The devil prompts you to think, I am not yet prepared to pray. I should wait for another half hour or another day until I have become more prepared or until I have finished taking care of this or that so that you will no longer thirst about prayer for the rest of, your, of the day. If I just put it off a little bit, I'll get ready in my mind and I'll be ready to pray and then I'll come to God in prayer. Or Luther also says, we are concerned, you are too unworthy and sin every day. Wait until you are more devout. You might be in the mood to pray now, but wait until you have confessed your sin and taken the Lord's Supper so that you can pray more fervently and approach God with confidence. This serious obstacle crushes us like a heavy stone. God's given us a wonderful tool when it comes to our prayer. We can talk to God. We can bring our request to Him. We can tell Him anything that is going on in our lives. Request any sort of help from Him. But when we depend on ourselves to say, I must be so prepared, I must be so worthy, you're never going to get there. And in fact, Satan uses that as a sort of temptation. He tries to silence us in our prayer life so that we cut off all communication with God. He wants us to stop talking to God. 
Better yet, he wants us to neglect the word of God so that God stops talking to us. Because when God stops talking to us, when we stop listening to him and his word, that's when we stop growing in faith. That's when we are easily led astray. That's when our faith starts to shrivel up and perhaps die. God wants the line of prayer open. He wants to speak to us, and he wants us speaking to him. Jesus was very much concerned with what was going on at that wedding. His mother requested his help, and he said, not yet, not at her time, but in his time, and for his purpose. And now he was going to act. He was going to act so that they could see what he could really do as the Savior. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned to wine. Jesus made his miracle debut. You want to know what God does? He does the works of God. That was what Jesus was doing, performing this miracle defying all nature. And there's a couple of important details in there. Those servants filled those jugs all the way up to the top with water. 20, 30 gallon jars. Filled them to the brim. There wasn't room to add anything else. It wasn't simply watered down wine that he had in there. There wasn't time to add anything else. He said, fill them up. They were filled up and now go take a glass of water to the master of the banquet. And that liquid that passed over the master of the banquet's lips was no longer water, but wine. He questioned the girl, why did you guys wait so long to bring out the good stuff? He didn't know where it came from. The groom didn't know where it came from. But those servants did. Jesus' disciples did. His mother did. Jesus was revealing himself, showing his glory, revealing what he could do as the Savior. But why choose a place like Cana? Why choose this venue that was off the beaten path, that wasn't a way to get national recognition? Because Jesus operates in a little bit different fashion than you and I do. In fact, if we go to the tail end of the lesson, we see the reason why he did what he did. Why it was important for him to change that water into wine. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. It was to give these disciples a sign, a marker to say, there's something different about this guy. He is who he says. He is true God. Because a normal person doesn't do this. It was to show them, you have your faith in the right place. This miracle wasn't going to change anyone's heart, but it was to confirm the faith that they had put in him. He was going along through his wedding sermon preaching, when suddenly there was a wedding stomp stopping thud. One of the bridesmaids at the end did a face forward face plant, just narrowly missing the communion step and the pulpit, going into an area with her head about yay big. Everybody stopped, rushed to her aid. Fortunately for her, nothing was broken but her pride. And the pastor, after everything gets settled down, says, how am I supposed to continue preaching to draw everybody back into that sermon? So even though he was only about halfway through, he said, I'm going to say amen here and let's get these folks married. Of course, we gave my brother-in-law no end of grief. How could he allow this poor girl to fall that way and face that embarrassment? Well, Jesus does more than spare us from embarrassment. Because the truth is, we have so much that is stacked up against us, 
so much that could be counted against us that it would leave us with nothing to say to God. When we stand before him in judgment, we would be in nothing but damnable silence. Think about that. How would you answer God and say, God, I have a really good reason why I trashed my friend's name. I have a totally good reason why I didn't pray to you more often. Why I didn't open your word, why I didn't listen to your word. God, it's, I can explain why I talked to my wife the way I did, why I yelled at my children the way I did, why I lied to my teachers. God, I can explain all... No, we can't. What do you say when you are dead, caught in the crosshairs, and you are at fault, and you know you deserve nothing but damnation? But Jesus saved us from more than just that embarrassing silence and that damnable silence. Jesus gave us the very words to speak. He points us to his word and what he's accomplished for us. When we are confronted by our sins, he says, I can tell you what to say. God, forgive me. God, I have one who took my place. Lord, I know by myself you should see nothing but sin, but I am covered in the blood of Christ. He's taken every one of those sins away. Lord, I know I have no business standing before you on my own, but I have the perfection of my Savior Jesus. I have his righteousness, and that is what he's clothed me in. God, you demand perfection. That's what I have, not because of anything I've done, but because of what your Son has given me. God, I know I deserve hell, but Jesus took my hell for me. God, I know I deserve death, but Jesus conquered death for me. God, I know I should be nothing but your enemy by nature. But you have made me your child through baptism. So God, you can welcome me into your kingdom. And God does. He says, you are my very child. You're the reason I sent my son in the first place, was so that you could have a place in, in heaven with me. Jesus gives us the very thing to say when we are confronted by sin. And here's another thing. Those lines of communication that we tend to try and cut, he's opened them up. So that now God says, you can come to me, you can speak to me as your dear Father in heaven. He says, very truly, whatever you ask in my name, my Father will give it. My Father hears you. Not that we're dictating to God how he should answer us, but we pray as we do in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, your will be done. And we're reminded that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. God wants to hear our prayers, and he does hear our prayers, and he answers our prayers. Now those things that cut the lines of communication are no longer an issue because God has given us standing before him. He's made us his children so that we can talk to our Heavenly Father. Today as we study our lesson of Jesus changing water into wine, not only does he reveal his glory, not only does he show us what he can really do as our Savior, but we're also reminded of another change he made. He did more than change water into wine, he changed sinners into saints. And that is what you are. Amen. Please rise.